Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Traveling Librarian. This is Jeff Glapes from the Reference Department at BB Library in Wakefield with some more armchair travel for you so you can see the world without leaving your home. WCAT, Wakefield's local cable TV station, has generously partnered with BB Library to help us share our programming with you, and I'm pleased to have you join me today for a tour of a beautiful, historic, and little-known corner of Greece. As well as on WCAT, you can also find more of these travel programs on the library's YouTube channel. And for more armchair travel photography, you can follow me on Instagram at Jeff Klapes or hashtag the underscore traveling underscore librarian. I hope you'll be able to join me online or back at the library eventually to tour some other interesting destinations as well. Um, but let's get started. Um, today we're going to visit um, a particular corner of Greece that is um, particularly important to me personally. Um, that's partly because my grandparents, um, both my, grand, my father's mother and my father's father, um, are from the Peloponnese in southern Greece. You can see that in uh, the southern portion um, of this map here, which divides Greece into its various regions. Uh, the Peloponnese is the southernmost portion of mainland Greece, and it's not a very uh, visited part of the country. Most people tend to focus on the islands. But the Peloponnese is very beautiful. It's rugged and mountainous. It only has about 10% of the country's total population, or about maybe a million people or so. Um, but despite that, it has an outsized position in the history of Greece, um, from ancient times all the way up to 1821, when it was the cradle of modern Greek independence. It's mostly off the beaten path, except for a few sites very close to Athens. Um, it's named for the island of Pelops. That's what the, the name actually means. Pelops um, in ancient Greek mythology was um, the son of Tantalus, um, who was the founder of the house of Atreus, a dysfunctional family if ever there was one. Um, Tantalus chopped up his son Pelops as an offering to the gods um, and with the exception of Demeter, um, the goddess, uh, nobody else actually ate of that meal. Um, the gods then decided, once they realized what had happened, to remake him um, with an ivory shoulder fashioned from, by the god Hephaestus. Tantalus was banished, um, and you'll probably remember Tantalus a little bit more because he's the one who eventually ended up in the underworld with um, an undying thirst and every time he tried to drink uh, or eat from the tree that uh, whose branches were above him, um, they retreated so that he could neither eat nor drink. Um, and from that, we get the word tantalize in modern English. Uh, the Peloponnese was also known in the Middle Ages as the despotate of Moria, a term that's still used uh, sometimes today. And it's divided into a number of different historical and geographical areas. Uh, many of which you've probably heard of. Um, Corinthia, which is um, closest to Athens, where the city of Corinth is located. Arcadia in, um, in the mountainous center. Um, and also Laconia, which is where we're going to spend our time today. The Mani Peninsula, which we'll be looking at in detail, is very mountainous and isolated. It's kind of humorously known as the middle finger of Greece because it's one, it's the central of the three um, south pointing peninsulas of the Peloponnese. Um, and it is known um, for its very strong independence and a very strong sense of local identity. It has its own local vocabulary and dialect of Greek. Um, and it also has a pretty violent history, um, but it's considered the birthplace of Greek independence. And it's a very beautiful and bleak part of the country, but now has a very uh, growing tourist industry even though it's still very much off the beaten path. You can see that the central spine of this peninsula is very mountainous as it heads to the south down to Cape Tenero. Um, this is the Taigatos mountain range, which is at its um, height in the area near Sparta, um, a little further north. We're going to focus on the area um, roughly from uh, crossing this uh, east-west central point here and going down to the tip. The two largest towns in the area are Yithio, where we'll start, and Areopoli, uh, where we will finish. Um, and again, on this um, topographic map, you get a better idea of just how, um, just how mountainous it is. 
Um, there's very few places where you can cross the peninsula from east to west. Mostly you're just going up uh, and down along the coasts. Um, the area to the, uh, to the east in the far upper uh, right-hand corner of, of the screen is the Evrotes River Valley, which is where Sparta is located just north off of the map. Um, Sparta is the capital of La Cunha, and it's one of the largest cities in the Peloponnese. Um, and of course, it has a long storied history itself. The Evrotes Valley is very different from the Mani Peninsula in that it is well watered by the Evrotes River, and it is a very uh, fertile valley with um, oranges and other citrus fruits grown there and a significant olive industry as well. But we're going to start in Ethio, the biggest and the most important town in the East Mani, known as the Anatoliki Mani. Um, it's the administrative center, um, the capital, if you will, of this area, and it is the largest of the towns anywhere here, although it still has only 7,000 people. The entire population of the Mani Peninsula is only about 15,000. So Ethio itself um, in, encompasses about half that population total. It's a lovely town um, with a very Venetian style. The Venetians, um, along with the Franks and the Ottomans and various other um, occupying forces over the centuries, um, imprinted their style um, on the landscape and on the buildings. So you'll see it actually does have a very Venetian feel to the architecture, which um, rises in tiers up the sort of amphi amphitheatrical um, shape of the hills right behind it. Um, this is actually a very old town, um, although most of what you see today is from the 19th century on. But Ethio existed um, millennia ago when it was once the port of ancient Sparta. Um, Sparta is actually quite a ways inland and Ethio was the, the closest uh, port from which uh, Spartans set sail. And here you can see an, another view of the houses rising up the slopes. Along the seafront, there's a lovely promenade. And there are lots of shops and fish, re fish restaurants um, and hotels, guest houses. It is a fairly good sized tourist center and also uh, a uh, commercial center for the people who live in the Mani. Here you can see octopus um, drying um, uh, in preparation for being grilled by the fish restaurants. Um, it may look a little gruesome, but octopus fresh out of the ocean is absolutely delicious, particularly when uh, fresh off the grill with herbs and garlic and olive oil. It's also a cruise port. You can see here there's a, um, a political statement um, on one of the um, local sailboats, um, but very few large cruise ships actually um, can dock in Ethio. It's simply not a large enough port. Um, but the cruise industry is certainly um, a, a major issue for tourism in Greece because it brings a tremendous number of people who spend money, but on the other hand, it also does have um, significant uh, environmental and, and other issues um, by bringing large numbers of people into places that can't necessarily support them. So it is, it is a political issue in the country. The little island that you can see just off the coast uh, is called Krani. It's also known as Marathonisi. Um, it was an island. It's actually now connected to the mainland by a causeway that you can walk out on. Uh, it's historically very important because uh, this is, according to legend, where Paris and Helen um, supposedly spent the night before they shipped off um, to head over to Troy, um, sparking off the Trojan War. Nowadays, the island is just a park. Um, that you can stroll around that has a beautiful old Maniot style fortified house, we'll talk more about those a little bit later, um, that has been turned into a museum of the culture and history of the Mani. The island also has a very nice lighthouse um, that you can walk out to, and if you go out on to, um, to stroll around this island, there's a beautiful view back um, to the town of Ethio. I've been to this area a number of times. Here I am with my teacher, Elisabeth, um, who lives in the Mani, um, splits her time between there and Athens. Um, she is a teacher where I um, took some intensive language courses uh, to learn to speak Greek. She's also a writer and a musician. She lives when she's in the Mani in this beautiful old farmhouse that she and her husband 
uh, restored in the hills not far from Ethio. It's an old farmhouse that they renovated and she now rents rooms um, for language study. This was the room that I had when I stayed with her. That was um, four years ago at this point. Um, in addition to her other talents, she is a fabulous cook. Here she is making a galaktamburko, which is a delicious Greek dessert made with phyllo dough um, and uh, sort of honey sugar syrup and uh, semolina pudding. Greeks are very friendly and I met many of Elizabeth's friends and here they are uh, waving goodbye to me as I went off on my next adventure. We're going to start um, our tour around the Mani on the eastern side, which faces the Gulf of Lacunia. Um, so we're just south of Ethio. Um, it's known as the Sunny Mani, the Iliaki Mani, and that's because it's in a rain shadow since the weather in this area tends to come from the west um, to the east. So the the eastern side um, of the mountain range is tends to be a little bit drier and more barren than on the west side. The distances are pretty short, um, but because the roads are narrow and twisty, um, it takes quite a long time to get anywhere. In fact, to get from the Ethio down to the, the tip of the peninsula um, can take about an hour and a half. But uh, here are just some examples of what the scenery looks like as you work your way down the coast. There are no large towns of any size south of Ethio, um, except for a couple of uh, settlements that have maybe a couple hundred people in them at most. Most of what you will see are tiny little villages and settlements, um, small coves, mountain villages, and a lot of little isolated beaches. Here the mountains drop very steeply to the sea and the road clings just to the edge of the cliffs as it drops down. Um, you'll also see as we head down um, a number of traditional Mani stone tower houses. We're gonna look at many of those as we go through the area. Most of them were built in the last two or three hundred years. Even though they look sort of medieval, um, they're much more recent than that. But they're a major draw for tourism because it's a particularly uh, interesting and unique architectural style um, that is found really nowhere else in Greece. As you work your way down, you'll see um, roads that cling to the sides of the, uh, of the hillsides and you may occasionally encounter traffic. Um, there's very little car traffic of any kind, but there are plenty of goats and cows um, which tend to roam freely. And there's occasional rock falls too. So you have to be careful when you drive, particularly at night. This is a view east to the Vatica Peninsula, uh, which is the easternmost of the three Peloponnesian uh, peninsulas that, that head south. So you're looking here across the Bay of uh, Laconia. The first village we're going to stop in is called Exonimfio, which is just a tiny little village perched on the mountainside. Um, here's uh, a path that walks into the main area. Um, if you're looking for a fixer-upper, um, this house, this old tower house, is for sale uh, at a pretty uh, reasonable price, but it needs to be properly restored. Um, given that the Mani has so many historic um, buildings in it, um, the Greek government is uh, very concerned about having them preserved and when they are restored, uh, they need to be restored up to certain historical standards um, in much the same way that you might find in historic centers uh, in the United States and elsewhere. Um, so there are grants available to fix up these houses um, if you're so inclined, but it is a lot of work. Um, the reason that I was in this village is uh, to actually look at a house because um, we are actually buying one of the properties um, that we came across um, and hope to finish that up this summer. Um, we'll see that house in a little bit. The, the village of Exonimfio is, is very, very tiny. There's probably fewer than 30 or 40 people in the whole place. There is this beautiful little church. There are churches and chapels everywhere in the Mani as in elsewhere in Greece. And here is Panayotis, who is the guy um, fixing up this particular house. Um, this is a small house that's perched on the cliff looking out over the ocean and um, his wife in the background. Um, we decided not to purchase this house because it needed an awful lot of work. Um, and what you're looking at in the living room here 
is actually an olive oil press. Um, it used to be um, not a private home, but the actual olive press for the village where um, people who grew olives in the area would bring them to this collective um, building that, um, where they would press the olive oil and then distribute based on the number of olive trees that they had. So it is kind of an interesting property because there's not much you can do when you have an olive press in the middle of your living room. So you'll just have to figure out how to live around it. Um, but you still got a ways to go on fixing up this house. Um, but it is a beautiful spot. It has a lovely terrace and looks out over the ocean uh, with just an incredible view. This is another tower in the same village. Um, most of these um, Maniot towers were used as protection during uh, previous centuries when there were, it was very common for there to be family feuds. Um, there were clan, uh, there was a sort of clan culture um, that often had serious disputes uh, that went on for decades um, between uh, different families. And in fact, some people spent their whole lives pretty much um, imprisoned in these towers because it was too dangerous for them to go out uh, in public because they would be killed um, in retribution for some other perceived family um, scandal or slight. Um, this is something that happened also in Italy and uh, Albania and other parts of the Mediterranean, um, but the Mani area was particularly known for it. And although uh, this kind of uh, absurd, violent lifestyle um, pretty much disappeared uh, in the late 19th century, um, it still has a, a lot to do with the culture and the mythology of the area. And the towers still exist, and so they're a, a significant reason why tourists come to look at the place. Again, here's just some views around this, this little village. Um, here are prickly pears, which are called francosica, um, or um, Frankish figs in Greek. Um, they are widespread all over the money, um, given the, dr the dry Mediterranean climate, um, and they um, provide a, a lot of fruit, as you can see on this example, and the fruits are edible. You can use them in a lot of different ways for, for juice, um, for jams, um, in cosmetics and other things. And again, just moving down the coast, you can see some typical uh, scenery. Here's an, an example of a roadside shrine. These are often assumed to be where people died in uh, traffic accidents, um, but as often as not, they are also um, in locations where there might have been a traffic accident where people actually survived. So they are um, erected in thanks um, to God for saving someone's life. There are also often indications that there's a chapel to be found somewhere near the road because there are so many chapels around the countryside, um, often in inaccessible locations, and these little uh, roadside shrines are often um, a marker that indicates that if you go off the, the side of the road, you'll find one of the chapels nearby. This is a tiny little village that has virtually no permanent residence called Spira, um, but like so many other places, it has a spectacular location on a bump uh, right over the ocean. A little further south is a collection of several small settlements known as the Maristica um, that has a number of towers. Um, it's also known as a place that has some very old quarries um, where red marble was found. And there's some war towers. You can see one up on the hillside, a little closer up. There is a monastery above the Maristica, and you can either walk or drive up to it. Uh, the monastery is known as Profitis Ilias, um, and if the cows are willing to let you pass, um, they can look a little threatening. But if you can get by the cows, you can get up to the top. Um, where there is an actual working monastery. It has only about one or two monks left in it. Um, that's true in many places around Greece where um, isolated monasteries still exist. But um, it's at the end of a dead end road up the mountain and it's just a spectacular otherworldly place. And 
right nearby um, are the red marble quarries. It's a very lonely kind of place. Uh, this is late in the afternoon, so you, you just feel like um, the world is just quietly ending up here. Um, but you can see in the buildings, this is the apse of the, the church that's part of the monastery. You can see the very distinctive red marble um, color in the building. And you'll see it um, in a number of the buildings around this part of the Mani. The view from up there is spectacular. We're looking um, back up north. Yithio is um, kind of behind the peninsula that you can see way up in the background. And there's a mix of um, monastic buildings that are still being used and also um, a number that are just in, in ruins. If you look down, um, you can see down to Ayos Kiprianos, um, which is the closest beach um, to the village that we're going to spend most of our time in. And you can actually see the road, um, which from the main road here, there is a small road that goes all the way down, um, and then you work your way down into the town and around the corner to get to the beach. We're gonna spend most of our time in a town called Lagia, which is one of the few villages on the East Coast that's um, of any substantial size, um, but it still has only about 30 people. Um, it's, a, it's a good size settlement geographically, but in terms of services, um, it has only a church and a taverna and nothing more. It is known for its many tower houses. It's spread out over a, um, the, the spine of a long ridge um, over a small plateau that's about 1,200 feet above the sea. So there's a, a very good view of the sea, but you do have to drive down quite a ways to actually get to the water. And these are not my photos, but I wanted to get um, use some aerial photos to give you a rough idea of what the village is like. You can see the, um, the central platea or town square here where there's a taverna with an outside terrace right across the street is the church. There are really no other um, services or monuments of any kind in the town, um, but you can see a large number of tower houses um, throughout the village. And then along the eastern uh, ocean facing side, um, there's a couple of small chapels and way down here, this building in the far left hand uh, corner is the house that we're purchasing um, this year as a vacation home um, and it has a tower as well. Here's another aerial view looking from the other direction that gives you also a, a good idea of the town square. The taverna is here um, with the platea and the, the Orthodox Church right across the street. And then behind it, there's a narrow little road, um, a pedestrian street that's only a couple of meters wide that goes down um, into the olive groves. And this tower here is the house that we're going to be purchasing. Um, the church is the Ecclesia Kimiseos Tisteotoku, which is the Church of the Assumption. Um, you can see the incredible bustling downtown of Lagia. Um, it actually during, uh, th this photo was taken during December when the weather is still quite nice, but there are no tourists anywhere. Um, it's a, a good time to be there if you want peace and quiet. During July and August, um, even um, sleepy Lagia does get um, a good number of tourists. There's several guest houses um, where you can stay, no big hotels, and of course only the one restaurant. The church itself is not incredibly old, but there are a number of other chapels around town that are old. Even in this tiny town, there were once around 30 um, churches and chapels um, in such a small place, um, and many of them do still exist, but this is the only one that is really large enough to have um, what you'd call a congregation. Um, the, the taverna is a very popular place with uh, excellent food, um, and it's run by um, the priest, Papa Yorgos, who is um, not only the priest, but he also runs the taverna and he's a local contractor if you need any um, work done on your house. Um, there's no post office, there's no police station, there's no school. Um, everything is kind of run out of the taverna. It is the center of village life.
um, for a village that has, at this point, only about 30 um, permanent residents. Um, if you're driving through town, just in case you um, might miss the taverna, they have conveniently um, noted in the middle of the road that there's a bar. And here's another view with where you can see a little bit more of the side of the church. It's built into the, the hillside um, and it has a beautiful view from the terrace out back, out over the plateau with all of the olive groves. The interior is a very typical Greek Orthodox style, um, although the painting that you see is very recent. This is 20th century painting, but done in a very traditional um, old Byzantine, Byzantine Orthodox style. Um, it's unusual in that when you enter the church, because of the hill, you actually enter at the top of the church and look down um, into the sanctuary. Here is a view from down below. Lagia is pretty sleepy at night. Here's the taverna. They do have outdoor seating. Um, because of the coronavirus epidemic um, in 2020, uh, Greece is kind of in an interesting position. Um, Greece, despite the fact that it's not exactly known for its uh, propensity for following rules or very effective government, um, and certainly the fact that it has had um, a very difficult time economically over the last decade or so, Greece um, surprised everyone by managing the coronavirus extremely well. And even though Greece has um, about 11 million people compared to Massachusetts, 7 million people, um, they managed to contain the virus in such a way that they have still um, in uh, June have had fewer than 200 deaths in the entire country, which is an impressive result given how close they are to places like Italy that suffered considerably worse. Um, Greece is now in the summer beginning to open up very carefully um, and they are allowing restaurants to do outdoor and indoor seating with um, significant restrictions. Uh, about 20% of Greece's economy um, is reliant on tourism, particularly in the islands um, and in Athens and Thessaloniki, the largest cities. So um, for a country with uh, difficult financial circumstances, um, it's very important for them to try to salvage what they can from, um, from the tourist economy, although they're doing so extremely cautiously. Here's the church at night. Um, I was there in early December, and um, this is about the extent of the Christmas decorations that you'll find in the town square. They have two small trees that they've put lights on, and they blare jingle bells from the Taverna um, sound system. Um, if you do want to eat indoors, which in December can be a good idea because it can get chilly at night, um, here's some examples of the kind of typical food you'll get. This is the sort of restaurant where there is no printed menu. You just go in and find out what they happen to be cooking that day, and they will bring out um, whatever seems um, good to eat. This is a sort of moussaka um, with vegetables, and um, there's a tripe soup in the background with homemade bread and a nice carafe of um, local retsina. The choriatiki salata, or village salad, um, which is usually big enough to serve an entire village, um, is also very common and a delicious thing to eat, particularly in the summer when it's very hot in Greece. Or you could try an entire whole and grilled squid um, with nothing but garlic, olive oil, little um, herbs like dried oregano and some lemon juice. And in the dish um, are local greens, wild greens called horta, which are just um, steamed, um, braised with some uh, olive oil, lemon juice, garlic, and so forth. It's a very simple food, um, but absolutely delicious. And in the restaurant, you will also sometimes find some um, unexpected guests and local entertainment. This is about as exciting as downtown Lagia ever gets. Um, in addition to serving food, the, um, the taverna also serves as I said, it's the post office, it's the town hall, and since there is no store anywhere in Lagia, um, you can buy local honey um, if you want. They sell guidebooks, tourist maps, um, and honey that's um, gathered uh, throughout the mountains. 
there are lots of wild herbs in the mani, um, and the honey is deliciously flavored with um, things like lavender, thyme, rosemary, and so forth. Lagia is known for having many um, of the historic typical tower houses, and some of them have been restored, some of them are still in ruins. Um, the unusual sort of tapered style of tower that you can see here is an older style, and there are very few of these in the Mani except in Lagia. Um, as I mentioned earlier, each of these towers was owned by a family and connected to the living quarters. You can see the ruins of those sort of at the bottom of this tower. Um, several buildings were, or smaller buildings were often attached together, um, and that's where people lived. The tower was essentially used only um, as a place uh, during extreme, extremely violent periods. Um, the entire family could um, sequester themselves in the tower, pull up the wooden stairways and ladders, and be completely protected in there. We looked at a couple of houses in Lagia, which I, I have to say is probably my favorite village um, in the Mani. Um, in the center of this photograph, you can see another house that we looked at to purchase um, and ended up deciding not to. Um, it's a new house. I have a couple of other pictures later. Um, it was built only about uh, 20 years ago, but um, following the rules of the historic district, it is in the same style as the older buildings. Here's an afternoon view over the village looking east as the sun uh, starts to go down behind the mountain range. Uh, one of the guest houses, we stayed in one one of the times that we were there. This is just an example of a traditional interior of an old tower house. Um, you can see that um, the windows can be completely sealed up with, um, with wooden blinds, and there are alcoves built into the stone with um, either wooden or sometimes slate shelving, which were used for storage. And this is um, an example of the wild nightlife of Lagia. Except for the taverna, there's virtually nothing going on in the town. Um, that may be something that you like, it may not. Um, if you want nightlife, Greece certainly has plenty of places to go, um, but Lagia is not one of them. It's a place where you go to escape and get peace and quiet. Um, here's just a number of scenes around the village that give you an idea of what it's like um, with both new and old houses. Um, the, the house that I mentioned that we were interested in purchasing um, was uh, a family house owned by a um, guy who lives in Athens now. And just at the entrance to the house, there's this little um, Byzantine chapel that you have to walk by um, from the street up to the front door. And here is the house. As I said, this is, I think this was built maybe in 2005, 2010, um, out of local stone and in um, a very traditional style. So um, it blends, blends in quite nicely with the area. There are older properties as well. This one used to be um, a second bar and cafe in the town that unfortunately is now closed. Many of the small villages in Greece are suffering from depopulation because um, unless they are strong centers of tourism, um, there's very little there except agriculture um, to do. So not surprisingly, uh, relatively few people stay there and uh, young people tend to leave as soon as they are able to move to the cities or elsewhere um, in search of uh, better opportunities, um, which is a unfortunate state of affairs, but it's common in many parts of, of Europe where tourism is, has not really taken hold. So the populations tend to be older um, and there are relatively few kids. Lagia does have a number of families with small children, um, so it's doing comparatively well, um, but it's still a, a very isolated and very different style of life. Um, if you go down below Lagia, there's a, a little neighborhood called Piontas, um, which is a settlement just down below, and there's a cemetery um, and a view back up to the village. Um, it's more of the tapered towers. 
as you can imagine, tower houses can be very expensive and difficult to maintain um, in good condition. So um, a lot of them are still in, in uh, desperate need of, of attention. The village has a number of uh, narrow, twisty, almost medieval style streets um, that are only for pedestrians. And it's a very peaceful place to walk around um, at different times of day. The light, um, depending on whether it's early morning or the bright sun of noontime or late in the afternoon, every building has a different personality at different times of day. This, um, this building here is a completely restored and, and renovated um, and new construction building that's been turned into a local history museum. Um, unfortunately, it's currently closed. Um, it's supposed to um, be a, um, a museum that would uh, talk about the history of the Mani region. Um, and I haven't talked to the locals yet to find out what the story is about if and when it may actually open to the public. The street um, that our house is on um, is here. This is a view from, if you head down behind the church, um, you can walk down this narrow little road. Uh, you'll note that the cobblestones maybe um, might, might see that they're, they're pretty new and in very good condition. And that's because only a few years ago, maybe five or six years ago, uh, the town actually installed water for the first time, water service. Prior to that, every house had its own cistern um, and collected rainwater for its own use. Now, um, most of the town has actual uh, municipal water service. So when they ran the pipes and down and dug up the streets, they uh, rebuilt them afterwards with new reinstalled cobbles. And you can see a, a line down the middle that's a drainage channel. Because when it does rain, um, it tends to rain very hard for very short periods of time. Um, and torrents of water will, will spill down the street. Here's some typical stonework in the neighborhood. And you can't, um, you can't not feel good about a village that actually has baby goats in your neighborhood. Um, it's a very rural area. There is a lot of livestock. Um, you'll see mostly, uh, mostly goats, um, very few sheep, mostly goats and cattle um, are what you'll see in this area. And of course, olive groves. Um, here's a gigantic rosemary bush in someone's front garden, known as Vendrolirano in Greek. And as you head out um, on the outskirts of the village, the cobbled streets sort of disappear into these um, stone wall bordered um, pathways that go off into the, into the olive groves. You may occasionally also come across what's called an aloni. This is a threshing floor. You can see it's a sort of round enclosure. Um, many of them still have the flat stones um, visible in, uh, in the flooring. And these were used for threshing wheat and other grains that were grown in the area. Um, they're usually about, oh, maybe four meters in diameter. Um, and you'll find them all over the money um, in villages and out in the countryside. Um, again, there are chapels everywhere, um, many of them in, in the village. And if you keep your eye out, you'll find all kinds of interesting little details in the buildings that you could very easily miss if you're not looking carefully. And almost every neighborhood has a tower that you can see. Here is um, myself with Niki, um, who is the owner of the, the house that we're buying and her husband, Yorgos. They uh, currently spend, uh, they live in Athens and, and work there. Um, they were running uh, the house as an Airbnb, um, but decided to sell it. And so we're going to be purchasing it as a vacation home. Uh, this is a view of the house from below. Um, the house is actually, this is two buildings. The house is actually this 
portion on the right, this tower on the left is actually a separate house that's physically attached. The view is just spectacular. It's on the east side of town, perched right at the edge, um, looking over the plateau. And I have a short video that'll give you an idea of um, how to get there. I thought I'd give you a quick look at the village of Lagia. This is the church and the platillo with the taverna, which are pretty much the only things here. Most of the town is up the hill. I just got back from a 15 minute run up the coast to Kokara, where there's a little mini market where I was <clears throat> able to pick up some groceries like Greek coffee and yogurt and honey and that sort of thing um, to eat. And I just wanted to show you what it looks like to walk from the square down to the house, which is just like a two minute walk. If you look off straight ahead, that's east towards the Gulf of La Conia. And there's a little side street down here, Cobblestone Street, we just had quite a rainstorm. It's actually supposed to be sunny later today, but there was a rainstorm for about 15 minutes that drenched everything. Um, the tower that you can see here is one of many of the Maniot style towers uh, all over the Mani area. Uh, the ones in Lagia are particularly noteworthy for being kind of um, tapered towards the top, which is an unusual style. There's another house that's being renovated with quite a few. all the houses here are stone because there's stone everywhere you might as well use it to build with So that gives you a little bit of an idea of what um, the neighborhood looks like. You can see that it's a pretty quiet little sleepy town. Again, here's the entrance to the house with its lovely courtyard. Um, the door that you're looking at here is the entrance to the tower. It's in fact the only entrance to the tower. Um, the interior is in very bad condition um, and it's not actually being sold along with the rest of the house because um, Nikki said that it's, it's owned by a number of different people um, in the family and it just gets a little bit complicated. Um, 
so it's kind of nice to be able to enjoy the view of the tower without the responsibility of caring for it. The two large um, terracotta jars that you see are known as pithari, and they were used for storing olive oil, um, among other things. And you can clearly see in this um, image the um, floor paving stones, um, which are a good example of that red marble um, that I mentioned comes from the, the quarries up the coast. And the other side of the courtyard shows a view of the upper and lower entrances of the house. Um, the, the, the upper door leads right into the main living room. The lower door um, is an area that would have originally, when the house was first built in the 19th century, would have been used for um, housing livestock. The family renovated this 19th century house around 2005 or so. Here's a view looking down uh, to the little street and a view from one of the terraces looking east out over towards the ocean. Um, and from the roof, which is one giant terrace, um, again looking east. Down below you can see a little bit of the cemetery that I mentioned. Uh, we'll take a closer look at that in a minute. And you can also look north um, to a separate neighborhood on a hill that's um, just on the outskirts of the main village. The house um, has two dining areas, um, one upstairs and one down. This is the lower one right next to the kitchen. Um, again, this is in the part of the house that would have originally been for animals. Uh, now uh, this archway has been partially filled in and um, there's a nice big window that lets you look out um, over the ocean. In the neighborhood. The entire flat roof, which is accessible by a little spiral staircase, um, serves as a terrace with views in all directions, and you can see the attached war tower that is um, accessible only from that door um, off the patio, the front patio. Inside, um, the house is beautifully furnished, and in fact, uh, we're purchasing it furnished, which is very handy. Um, there's, this is very typical um, country-style Greek furnishings. There's a uh, fireplace in the living room, wood-burning fireplace. The main floor has um, nice wood floors and stone um, and whitewashed walls. Off to the left uh, is one of two bedrooms, um, which has an attached bathroom. And that funny little um, thing that you can see in the floor <laughs> is known as a katapakti. It is a trap door. Um, that leads with stone steps um, and a little ladder down to the lower level. Um, it would have originally been used to check on the animals without having to go outside. So you could, um, you could, when the animals were sleeping down below in, in their protected um, area, without actually going outside, you could check on them and feed them and, and, and what have you. Now it serves as the main way of getting from one part of the house to the other without actually having to go outside and then out the front door and back in again. This is the bedroom down below um, and you can see where the trap door leads to a little stair, a uh, little ladder, wooden ladder that brings you down onto the lower level. Down here there's a kitchen with a door that goes out to the lower terraces in the garden and this, this huge single room again would have been used for livestock. It's now just one big room with a tile floor and little alcoves that provide space for extra um, sleeping. There's also another bathroom on this level. And outside, um, there's some really nice stone terraces um, down the hillside um, with beautiful views. Um, there's an olive tree, there's a carob tree, and even a pomegranate tree, and places to sit out in the shade. During the summer, um, the, the weather in the Mani tends to be extremely hot and dry um, and uh, shade, um, the, the, the cool uh, interior of a stone house can be very nice um, at that time of year and um, the shade of a garden um, is also very good. Here's a, an example of what um, uh, a roda or pomegranate 
um, looks like uh, when they're ripe. There's a lot of great hiking in the Lagia area around the village, both above and below. Um, you can kind of wander at will um, among the paths. Um, when you get up in the mountains, uh, you can look down to the village. There are just gorgeous views. And you'll also see a lot of old walls and foundations um, from settlements and farms that uh, used to be in the area um, decades or centuries ago and are now just um, isolated ruins. This is again looking east towards the uh, Vatica Peninsula. Just below the house, there are two lovely Byzantine chapels. This is one of them. Um, there's a stone path. And when you come around the corner, uh, this is only about maybe 50 feet or so from the house. Um, there's this little chapel, which inside is just exquisite, very plain, very simple, um, but with a uh, painted iconostasis, typical of uh, an Orthodox church behind which is the altar hidden in that little alcove. Close-up of the paintings. Um, there are chapels like these all over the Mani Peninsula, um, some of which are only a couple of hundred years old, some of which are over a thousand years old. Um, I mentioned the little cemetery earlier as you head down towards uh, Piontes, that little neighborhood. Um, this is another chapel. Um, right next to the cemetery and if you look up um, just to the left of that cypress tree you can see the tower and the house um, and a little better view um, this is one of the above ground tombs and here's the house looking down over the plateau off to the right you can see the church um, where the center of the village is located if you go all the way down into Piontes, um, a little further down, you get a great view back up towards the main uh, village of Lagia. Piontes has its own Orthodox church um, that has recently been repainted inside. It's absolutely beautiful. Um, and there's some ruined buildings too. Here's an old fortified tower house complex. There's also a, a monastery as well um, in partial ruins. Um, and you can just kind of wander around the area and explore on your own. On a sunnier day, here's a view up in the hillside above the, the village, looking up the coast and east towards the ocean. There are ruined chapels everywhere. Um, here's one that has really nothing left but the foundation and lower walls. And you'll also find a lot of agricultural enclosures. Um, there are terraces known as pezuli, um, and like terraces all over the world, they're used to maximize um, the agriculture um, that you can get out of a very hostile landscape. Um, and so with as much uh, rock as there is to build with, they piled them up into endless terraces on which they could grow vines, um, and other kinds of uh, grains, olives, um, and other subsistence farming. It makes for great exploration. Uh, the fall, um, I was most recently there in October and again in December. Uh, fall is the time to prune the olive trees and then pick the fruit. So it's a, it's a fun time to be um, in Greece because you can see that happening. Trained people tend to do the pruning um, because it's very important to know exactly which branches um, need to be removed in order to ensure the proper growth of the trees. And then less trained uh, workers come in afterwards to do the actual picking of the olives, um, which are usually gathered up in uh, tarps and then taken off to processing plants um, where they're either turned into olive oil or um, are actually sold for olive fruit. Uh, Greek olive oil, particularly the Kalamata olive oil that you will find in this part of the Peloponnese is among the best in the world. But um, unfortunately, in, um, for a long time, it's tended to be um, exported for mixing with um, olives from other countries like Spain and Italy, um, which are among the biggest producers 
Um, and that's too bad because if the uh, Greek olive oil is produced by itself, it's of extremely high quality and brings a much better price. So you're starting to see, uh, particularly in the Peloponnese and in Crete also, um, more um, producers who are trying to take advantage of um, marketing organic, um, locally produced olive oils that are um, unadulterated and um, not blended with lesser quality oils. Um, this is a much more lucrative um, way of, of marketing the oil and bringing in a much better price. So that's, that's a trend that I hope will continue in Greece. Um, if you have an opportunity to buy um, this kind of olive oil, whether from Greece or elsewhere, um, Sicily is another place that's doing that. Um, and here in the United States, there's some very good producers in California. Um, but it is well worth it to get the highest quality oil that you can um, because it is not only delicious, but um, very healthful as well. Here's another view of the village from kind of up behind. And in hiking around the mountains, um, I came across a number of these unusual little bulb plants um, that look kind of like uh, giant leeks or onions in the ground. They were all over and it took me a little um, research to figure out what they were. In Greek they're called askeletura and they are in fact related to onions and leeks, um, although they grow wild and they are often um, dug up and uh, planted outside the door of uh, Greek homes at the beginning of the new year uh, for good luck. another view out over the plateau. And if you're hiking around, you may even come across one of these. Um, this is a wild boar. It's good not to get too close to them because um, they're nasty animals. Um, you might hear cows um, and goats in the underbrush, um, but it's a little alarming to come around the corner of a path and see one of these staring you in the face. These are just more scenes from around the area. Typical Mani landscape, which is very barren, very rocky, very scrubby, and very Mediterranean. If you've traveled anywhere in this part of the world, you'll know this is uh, a very typical landscape for any Mediterranean culture or climate. You'll come across unknown ruins all over the place, and then um, you'll emerge from behind a tree and see a spectacular view both up into the mountains and down towards the sea. This is another one of the little chapels very close to our house. It has a, a nice little bell tower and a beautiful carving and painting over the doorway. And inside the, um, the interior wall paintings are just spectacular. And you would never know from the outside of the building um, just how gorgeous it is. And indeed, if you were a tourist on your way through Lagia, you may stop at the Taverna for lunch and take a stroll around the village, but you might never know that there were several places like this, um, that if you just open the door and take a peek, you'll see this inside. Even the ceiling is just incredible for such a tiny little chapel. Lagia has both old and new homes. Um, this is, again, another example of a very recent house. This is completely new, not a renovation. Um, it's designed to look like an old, partially ruined tower house. Um, and this is an actually old house. You can tell a little bit better, but just by looking at the stone that it's, um, that it's an older property. This one is being renovated by the priest. Uh, Papa Yorgos, who is um, not only the taverna owner and the priest, but as I mentioned, he's also a contractor. So he is renovating this for sale, um, hopefully later this year. The part of the, uh, the lowest part of the house that you can see is actually a Byzantine chapel um, that's actually a part of the, the building itself. And here he is. <laughs> wearing one of his many hats in the village. Um, we're going to leave Lagia now and um, make our way around the rest of the peninsula just to give you another uh, wider idea of what the place looks like. Um, the closest beach to Lagia is about 15 minutes away, 
um, mostly straight down. If you take the main road and go past this beautiful church, this is probably my, I think I would have to say it's my favorite church in the world, um, just because I love the location and um, the isolation of this little chapel. It's called Ayos Nicolaos. And if you pass that and go down the very steep road to Ayos Kiprianos, um, you'll find that there's really nothing there but a very small beach settlement, very typical Greek um, corner. And there is a small rocky beach here, but if you go around past the village, you'll come to a completely isolated beach. This is called Abelo Beach. Um, and there's almost nothing there. Um, there's one tiny little cottage um, and you will pretty much have the place to yourself. Um, you can swim in the Mani um, as late as October and November. The water is still relatively warm, um, depending on the weather. Um, and certainly in the fall, you'll find very few tourists because the July-August period is the, um, the most popular and busy time. A little further down, um, you will come to Cape Tenaro, Akrotirion Tenaron, which is the southernmost mainland part of Greece. Um, and in fact, it's the second um, most southernmost uh, part of Europe after uh, a part of Spain. Um, it's also known as Cape Matapan. Here is a uh, topographical map giving you a bit of an idea of what it's like. It's, um, it's almost its own peninsula off the Man Mani Peninsula. There's a narrow, you approach it via this narrow little neck of land, um, which is adjacent to Puerto Cayo Bay, we'll stop there, and uh, Marmari Bay. And then the rest of the peninsula is very barren. There's only a couple of tiny little settlements and some ruins, um, and you really do feel like you are at the end of the world. There's a number of stunning bays, isolated chapels. Here you can see um, some more examples of the terracing. The settlement at the very southern tip um, was originally an, an important ancient site for the billeting of mercenaries while they waited for assignments. Um, and it was also a religious site dedicated to Poseidon. So there was a sanctuary um, there in his honor. Uh, it was also in ancient Greece considered to be a location of one of several entrances to the underworld. Um, this is the um, entrance that was guarded by Cerberus, the three-headed dog of mythology, um, who guarded the entrance to Hades. This is also where Orpheus um, supposedly went to rescue Eurydice um, and a number of other important things like, uh, this is actually where Hercules went and killed Cerberus. Um, that was one of Hercules' famed 12 labors. So if you think New England is historic, um, try living in a place where Hercules used to hang around. Uh, the views are just stunning as you come down from the mountain and you can see the entire peninsula spread out before you. Marmari is one of the only resorts in the area. It's still not very large. Um, and it has one of the only sand beaches in the area. Most of the beaches in the Mani are uh, rocky pebbles. There's also the ruins of um, an important tower complex. This belonged to a clan known as the Grigorakis clan, um, and it makes for a great hike um, and a fairly easy one because it's very close to the road. Uh, you can walk up um, from a little parking area and explore the ruins of the tower. And when you get up there, there's a great view back down uh, to the bay of Porto Cayo. There are uh, more chapels and terraces around the area with olive groves, rosemary, thyme, uh, and other wild herbs. In the fall, you're likely to see a lot of wildflowers, including fall cyclamens, which are very tiny and, and grow very close to the ground. And I have no idea what these are, but they were beautiful. And off in the distance, you won't hear much of anything except wind and the um, bleeding of goats and 
cowbells and things like that. Uh, this little isolated beach is also quite gorgeous um, and reached by a rocky path that um, you get to um, from a settlement that's barely a handful of houses. Puerto Cayo is a beautiful protected bay which comes from the French word for quail, cay. Um, and this was a place where there was a big quail migration um, annually and the, the birds would tend to stop over there and hunting was very popular and then they were exported from, um, from the bay. Now it's just a, a nice little uh, touristy area where you can go swimming, diving, fishing, boating, um, or just eat a great lunch literally at the edge of the ocean. At the furthest uh, southernmost point of the uh, peninsula, there is a little bay where you can see the temple to, the, to Poseidon or what's left of it. Um, it was later turned into a church and there are ruined mosaic floors around the area also. Um, it's worth it to take the maybe roughly 30 to 45 minute walk out to the very, very tip um, where you can see um, a lighthouse, now automated, um, that stands at the southernmost part of mainland Greece. Um, if you head south from here, there's absolutely nothing until you hit Africa. It's an amazing place to be early or late in the day because the light um, is just gorgeous for photography and just looking at the beautiful sunrises and sunsets. We'll now take a turn up north on the west side of the peninsula and the first stop is called Vathia. This is probably the most famous village in all of the Mani because of its incredibly dramatic location and its dense concentration of tower houses. There's an unparalleled view from Vathia um, up to the north and the village itself um, while almost entirely abandoned at this point, it's essentially a ghost town, um, is just stunning from almost any viewpoint. Most of the houses that you see in Vathia are from the 18th and 19th century, um, and most of them are actually ruined and abandoned. A couple of them have been fixed up, um, but the vast majority of them are still just in ruins, so it's very much a ghost town to explore. Um, it once had over 200 people um, and many, many families and was the center of a major clan war uh, that went on for decades. Now there's nothing but wind <laughs> and dust and the occasional tourist. Um, you can, from the, the terrace where I took this photograph, you can actually see another one of the houses that we looked at right here um, is a property that um, is a newish house. The, this house and the house next to it are actually known as Tsi. It is actually a, a named village with only two buildings in it. Vathia during the summer is a big spot for tourists who are making a, a day trip tour around the peninsula, um, but at other time of, times of year there's hardly anything there. Although you will occasionally find locals who will eye you warily as you explore. If you enjoy looking for details, you'll see them everywhere in the stonework, um, the different types of construction, wildflowers, buildings. Um, you can go in a number of the buildings um, if you're careful just to see what's left. Um, obviously, um, these are places that could benefit from some restoration. The Greek government actually did, way back in, I think it was the 1970s or 1980s, try to promote um, tourism by turning Vathia into an actual restored uh, destination for tourists that would have tavernas and guest room houses and so forth. Um, and they tried to promote that 
with um, funding and, um, and initiatives, but it never really caught on. The most magical time in Vathya is late in the day because again, this faces west. Um, so the setting sun lights up the limestone buildings with a warm glow. And you can look down um, about 600 feet. That's about how high up the village is down to the coast where there are several small beaches. And here's a close up of Tsi, which I mentioned before. Um, so this village actually has nothing but this house and that house. Um, the house that we were interested in purchasing and, and ended up deciding not to, which is, is currently um, for sale. And then the other house um, I understood from the real estate agent is pretty much empty most of the time. It's owned by a doctor who lives in Sparta, which is a couple of hours away, and he hardly ever uses the place. So he really doesn't have much going on in it. Very isolated place, but extremely beautiful with views all the way up the coast. Another one of my favorite villages, um, and probably the highest in this area, is called, called Muntanistica. Um, here's the little road that goes up to it, and you can see, heading, looking south, the amazing views. Um, it, there's a very narrow and precipitous road that leads up to it. Um, in this road, you can almost see, these are, um, this is another example of um, extensive terraces. The village is spread out along a ridge at the very top, and then all of these terraces that um, work their way down the hillside, one of them, and I don't think I can actually tell you which, I think it might be this one here, is the road. Um, it's barely wide enough for one car, um, but it is now the only way to get up to the village. Um, it is a dead end road. And I have another short video to give you an idea of what that's like. This is the main road. This is the only road. And it's kind of a good thing that Montanistica doesn't have a lot of people in it because you're not as likely to see someone coming down the other way. As you can see, we're kind of high up. This isn't really the scary bit yet, the scary bit comes up in a little bit more. They have plenty of big pullouts if you run into another car. Lots of terraces. Yes, I do need first gear. David is on camera duty, just so you know that I'm, I actually have both hands on the wheel. And you can 
see all the way down to the end of the Lying Peninsula. saw that same cow yesterday. stretch of road is actually just on one of the many um, agricultural terraces that goes down quite a way. festival up here every year, but I find it kind of hard to believe because I don't know how you would get lots of people up, thousands of people up here plus the cars, because there's room for about three cars when you get to the top. This is one of my favorite villages, so I have liked it on Facebook. but they don't post very much. And we're going to park here because it's easier. So I hope that gives you a little bit of an idea of what it's like to drive in the Mani Peninsula. Um, you can see this is actually looking back down from Muntanistica, the, the road that we just came up in that video. Uh, it's about 2,000 feet up above sea level and essentially a dead end. You can drive a little bit beyond the village to a couple of other tiny little settlements in the mountains that are just a couple of houses. Um, the whole village has fewer than 20 residents um, and that's on a good day, um, but the view is just outstanding. And it's a very long skinny village that stretches along uh, the ridge. There are a couple of houses for sale. Um, if you're interested in a tower house, um, you can pick up, uh, I think there's two of them for sale currently in the village that are um, beautiful views and in need of quite a bit of restoration work, but you'd have quite a place when you were finished. You'll also see that the surrounding area has a lot of beekeeping um, that is the, which generates the honey that you see in all the, the shops around the area. This is downtown, um, Muntanistica, the main square. 
And like many other Mani villages, there's absolutely nothing to do except just sort of poke around and um, explore the, the little narrow alleyways and the gardens and views. It really is like living on top of the world. This, as I said, is probably one of the highest elevation villages um, in the whole region. If you go back down to the ocean, though, we're working our way up the west coast. Um, Yeroi Menas is a much busier tourist hub with a large, very protected harbor, and it's a good spot to stop to pick up supplies, and um, there are tavernas, shops, restaurants, even a grocery store, um, and some hotels. This is actually a very old town. The name means Old Harbor, Yeroli Menas. Um, and it's in a particularly beautiful location at the base of some huge cliffs. Um, it was and still is a fishing port, although most of it, uh, most of its economy now is based on tourism. The village has maybe about a hundred people in it um, at most, which is big for this part of the money. Um, and there are quite a few guest houses and places to eat. There's even a gas station. Um, you can hike up that narrow path that you can kind of see up in the back. There's a um, switchback path that goes up to the top of um, what's known as Cabo Grosso, um, which looms up over the port and has fantastic views. This is a general view of the coast in that area. And some typical traffic. Around Yerolimenes are a number of beautiful beaches. Um, and this is a close up just to show you how there's no sand um, with the exception of a couple of um, specific places. Most of the beaches um, are not sandy beaches like we have in New England, but rocky Mediterranean beaches with pebbles, um, rounded pebbles that are mostly made of limestone, marble, um, and other kinds of um, soft stones. In Greece, um, it is actually written into the constitution that um, the coastline is available to the public. Um, beaches are, um, are public and the, you have the right to access um, the water. That does not necessarily mean that there's going to be any amenities. Um, most of the beaches in this little stretch um, don't have very many people, nor do they have much in the way of parking. So you probably just need to find a little place to, to put your um, car by the side of the road and then walk in. Um, here's some of the rosemary that you'll see growing wild everywhere. And the stunning rocky coastline that's very dramatic along here. And the beautiful um, water, Mediterranean water that just is a stunning color of blue. The blue and white together, of course, is a very iconic um, image of Greece, and you see it in the Greek flag, um, and you see it in the Greek landscape. So this is just, the, this whole stretch um, is full of these isolated little coves where you can spend the afternoon and hardly see another living soul. A little further up um, and looking back in east into the mountains is one of the other um, good-sized villages in the area called Kita. Um, it's possibly from the Italian um, Chita, meaning city. Um, it does have a sort of mini Manhattan feel because it's one of the most dense clusters of tower houses. Um, although unlike Vathia, this is Kita is not abandoned. It's uh, a village with quite a few people in it, and it's it's even a decent sized village with some services and places to eat and places to stay. Um, it's not on the water, it's um, much further inland. Bear in mind many of these villages um, with the tower houses, you'd think that they would have been built along the gorgeous coastline, but that's because they were built long before tourism was important. Um, they were built up into the mountains for protection from, um, from pirates um, and also from each other. So um, it was a very different kind of um, lifestyle back when these villages were first built. 
another attraction in the area is the huge, and um, by huge, I'm talking in the hundreds, um, number of Byzantine era churches and chapels that you'll find all over the place. Many of them are in villages um, or on the outskirts, and some of them are off in the middle of nowhere. Um, this is true all over Greece, um, but you'll particularly find it in the Mani. Many of them are closed unless you ask um, around locally in the nearest village for a key, but many of them are open for a peak. Uh, the best ones date from about the 12th to the 14th century, like this one here, um, and they often have frescoes inside that were either added or restored later. Some of them are in very good condition, others are in deplorable condition, um, but it's uh, well worth it to seek out um, any number of them um, to see how different they can be um, and also how atmospheric. This is a particular one um, that is um, recognized by the government and, and historically protected and has received some funding to, to keep it um, secure. Um, both the weather and vandalism over the years have taken a toll on many of these and the cost um, to keep them in good condition is, is astronomical. Um, but fortunately, a good many of them are uh, un under reasonable care at this point. This one is um, in an isolated village called Diporo um, in the foothills not far from Kita. And many of them have uh, interesting carvings both inside and out with beautiful detailed stonework. Of course, olive oil production is very important um, here um, because olives are one of the few things that can grow in such a hostile kind of um, climate. So it's a big industry in the Mani on both sides of the peninsula, and especially as you head up into the fertile valleys of Messenia and um, Laconia, um, as you get very far north towards uh, Sparta and Kalamata, where there are wide valleys very suitable for uh, large-scale olive growing. But even in tiny little villages, you'll find olive trees growing in all kinds of places. Partway up the western coast also is this unusual formation called the um, Tigani Peninsula. Tigani is the Greek word for frying pan, and you can get an idea of why it's why the peninsula is named that because it's nothing but a hot dry spit of rock that sticks out into um, into the Mediterranean and it used to originally have a Frankish fortress on it in the Middle Ages which is now in ruins that you can explore. Um, it may have been the site of what was at the time called the Maina Castle um, and that's one of the um, possible origins of the name Mani. There are several unconfirmed theories about where the name comes from. Um, and the castle that used to be on this peninsula uh, was known as Mina Fortress. Uh, it may have been here, it may have been a little bit further south, they don't totally know. Um, and a little further up, um, almost at the same level as Yithio, where we started our tour, is the town of Areopoli. This is the only other good-sized town anywhere in uh, the southern Mani. Um, it's got about a thousand people, so it's still quite a bit smaller than Yithio. It was originally called Simova, but it was renamed in honor of the war, war god Ares um, because of its role in the War of Greek Independence in the 1820s. It has a decent-sized commercial center, um, even a supermarket and lots of restaurants and uh, shops and so forth. The war um, for independence started at Areopoli um, on March 17th in 1821 um, by a man named Petros Mavromikalis, who was the last bay of the Mani. The bay was the, the word uh, for a local ruler, semi-independent ruler of um, the Mani Peninsula under the Ottoman Empire. And in addition to having several nice squares and little back streets, um, Areopoli also has some major churches like this one with its um, beautiful tall bell tower. And on the outside of the apse, you can see some interesting carvings of the zodiac, uh, which is kind of unusual for the area. The 
outer money, um, as opposed to the inner money where we've been so far, um, as you head up north towards Kalamata in the west, is much more not lush and green than the area that we used to um, be in earlier in this presentation. And I, I use the word lush um, uh, in a comparative sense because it is still a very dry um, Mediterranean climate, um, but you will see a lot more trees. Um, and because again, the weather tends to come from the west, this gets more rainfall and moisture than the east side of the peninsula. And you'll see villages like this um, surrounded by lush um, Mediterranean forests. This is La Cala. And probably the best known village in the area is Cardamili, which is the central tourist center in the outer Mani that has several hundred people in it and a lot of surfaces and some very nice historic sites. It's also home to the um, uh, just south of Cardamili in a, in a little um, outside settlement nearby is the home of Patrick Lee Firmer, who lived from 1915 until um, he died um, at quite a ripe old age in 2011. He is revered in Greece for his participation in the Greek resistance in World War II. He was British um, and he started um, from a pretty young age in his, in his late teens, um, traveling all over um, Europe, particularly Eastern Europe. And he's one of the 20th century's most famous travel writers. And he built this beautiful house um, where he spent much of his later life in Greece with his wife, Joan, um, writing books. Um, he's written a number of uh, very beautiful travel books about Greece and also other parts of Europe. He, um, he hiked the entire length of the Danube River. Um, if, you, if you enjoy really good travel, classic travel writing, um, he's a good person to try. Um, and he does have a book specifically about the Mani, um, which is also a classic um, of uh, local history literature. Um, the house is gorgeous. It's very lovely, very homey. It used to be open for visits, um, but it was recently renovated. Um, it was in need of quite a bit of renovation and um, an institute uh, nonprofit in Athens um, put some money towards it um, to do the needed restoration and it is now being used as a writer's retreat. And it's just, uh, the house itself is absolutely gorgeous and the location can't be beat either, um, right on a, a little cove facing west out over uh, the Gulf of Messinia. Also in Cardamili is Old Cardamili, which is just uh, a short walk inland from the main uh, tourist part of town. This was a stronghold of the Murzinos clan, which were rivals, a rival family of the Mauro Micalis family, um, from further south in Ariopoli. And their complex has now been restored and is a museum, um, an excellent museum um, that you can visit that has a church, um, the original tower house, um, and even nearby is a path that goes by the tomb where the Castor and Pollux are supposedly buried. Um, you'll remember them as the twins um, whose mother was Lita, but they had different, uh, different fathers. Castor was the mortal son of Tyndarius, who was the king of Sparta, um, and Pollux was the divine son of Zeus. Um, Zeus, um, the god, seduced Leda in the guise of a swan, and Pollux um, came out of that union. Um, and you might not remember also that um, their half-sisters were also quite famous, Helen, who kicked off the Trojan War when she ran off with Paris, and Clytemnestra, who was also uh, known for um, being part of the same uh, family as Agamemnon and Menelaus and all that lot. Um, and she had quite a life too, which is chronicled in, in a number of uh, famous uh, ancient Greek plays, which I hope you'll read if you haven't already. So, um, I hope you've enjoyed this tour of the Mani. It's one of my favorite parts of Greece, so this has been kind of a, a more personal tour than some of my other programs. Um, 
if you ever get there, I hope you stop in Itilo Bay where you can see here, um, you can have a meal and a drink and overlook the bay and watch the sun set over the Gulf of Messenia um, in one of the most beautiful places in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so that's it for now. Thank you for traveling with me on this somewhat personal tour of a place that's very special to me. I hope you'll join me again at the library online or on WCAT um, for more destinations. And again, for more armchair travel photography, do follow me on Instagram at Jeff Klapes or hashtag the underscore traveling underscore librarian. So I hope to see you soon and keep exploring. Thank you.